Thank you very much, Heinrich, and thank you, Brian, for inviting me to come to this great conference. So I'm going to talk about energy plans that we've been developing over the last decade. Our first one was in 2009 to transition uh, cities, states, countries, and the world to 100% clean renewable energy for all purposes. And that's all purposes is, is I'll show you, is electricity, transportation, heat and cooling, industry, agriculture, forestry, fishing. The reason I'm interested in this is to try to address and solve large-scale air pollution and climate problems. Air pollution causes four to seven million premature deaths each year worldwide. 20% uh, of these are children under the age of five years old. It's estimated to cost, based on statistical cost of life, on the order of 20 to $25 trillion per year right now. Uh, climate change is a growing and significant problem expected to cost on the order of 25 to $30 trillion per year by 2050. And then energy security is another big issue. Fossil fuels are limited resources. They'll run out eventually. That will rise in price and social and economic instability over time. And so these are all drastic problems that require immediate and drastic solutions. So the idea is to electrify everything or provide direct heat for everything and where the electricity and the heat are from clean and renewable energy. And namely, in our case, we're proposing using just wind and water and solar power for everything. So there's, there's no nuclear power, no fossil fuels with carbon capture, uh, and in fact, no biofuels in our, in our scenarios here. Although it doesn't preclude this, but this is just what our, these are our scenarios. And so for transportation, we'd have battery electric vehicles, hydrogen fuel cell for long distance transportation, like long distance ships and trains and, and, and uh, ship, uh, sorry, and airplanes. And I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Uh, and and uh, heat and cooling, we'd use heat pumps for the most part, some solar hot water preheating. For industry, high temperature industrial processes, we'd use arc furnaces, induction furnaces, dielectric heaters. And all this electricity would be produced from just onshore and offshore wind, so solar photovoltaics on rooftops and in power plants, concentrated solar power, geothermal power, small amounts of tidal wave, and existing hydroelectric power. And so just some examples. Um, these are, for the most part, we're talking about existing technologies like arc furnaces, induction furnaces, can be used for high temperature processes. Uh, trucks are already being built long distance trucks are already being built, either electric, like Tesla has a semi, uh, Nikola One has a hydrogen fuel cell semi, uh, Proterra has an electric bus, and there are hydrogen fuel cell electric hybrid buses already on the road in many places in the world. Um, in terms of uh, military, I have a student, we're looking at transitioning uh, the whole entire military, the army, in fact, to uh, electric or hydrogen fuel cell. So, and we so we done, done analysis on to, because there you have to have certain specifications for tanks. Their their size and their weight can't be too great. So, for example, the M1 Abrams tank, if we electrify that, uh, it would be the same same uh, volume, maybe a little bit more mass, up to 20% more mass. But you can see all these, a lot of them are either the same mass or just 10 to 20% more. Uh, interesting thing about electric tank is that you have less heat production, and so heat-seeking missiles won't uh, can't be used to, for electric tanks. It turns out, and <laughs> this is one of, the, one of the minor benefits, right? <laughs> uh, this is the same thing if you you convert them to hydrogen fuel cell, and we've done this for airplanes as well, and and ships and trains uh, for pretty much everything that the military would use, and also civilian like 747s. And so in terms, of uh, in terms of hydrogen fuel cells, uh, they'll actually use, in most cases, less volume uh, and even less mass than a conventional uh, diesel fuel uh, tank or, or uh, other type of machine. Um, but in terms of electrification, there are some aircraft companies, that mostly startups, building electric planes. So on the left is an electric aircraft that only seats two, but it can go up to 1,500 kilometers. On the bottom right is a four-seat hydrogen fuel cell aircraft that can go up to 1,500 kilometers. Um, on the top right is a drawing, it's not an actual plane, but of a, a hydrogen, cryogenic hydrogen aircraft that would have more volume, but actually way less. And so the overall drag should be similar to a jet fuel aircraft. Um, but we want to electrify everything, so that includes uh, lawn mowers and forklifts and even annoying leaf blowers. I mean. Everybody hates a leaf blower because it not only smells but has a lot of noise. But your electric leaf blower doesn't have either doesn't smell or have noise, and so there's an, obviously an advantage there as well. Uh, big, 
new developments in the last couple of years, offshore floating wind. Uh, there's one offshore floating wind farm uh, off of the UK right now, and there's another one being built. And this is really important because there's the greatest untapped resources are offshore for wind, and especially you can go further offshore without annoying people. And so this is a real big benefit. And the cost of wind has come down. Uh, the latest, well, in the US, the latest cost of wind, even though there's only one wind farm installed, but Lazard, who projects cost of energy, estimated nine cents a kilowatt hour uh, for new wind, offshore wind. That was down two cents from even last year, from 11 cents a kilowatt hour. But I think there are even some bids coming in at seven cents a kilowatt hour for offshore wind. And then floating solar is growing. Uh, there's a, over a gigawatt, I think, installed worldwide already of floating solar. Um, but we'll need storage. So uh, for each of these energy sectors, so we're proposing, and I think a lot of other people are also proposing, concentrated solar power with storage. Uh, there'll be some batteries, pumped hydroelectric power, and existing hydroelectric dams are basically big batteries. And uh, heating for heating cooling sector, we'd store in water and rocks underground for, for heat and water and ice for cold. And also hydrogen's a form of storage and we'll also use demand response to try to keep the grid stable. And I'll discuss that uh, a little bit later. So for example, um, my university Stanford from 1998 to 2015 had a big ice cube under a building. And uh, at night when the electricity price was low, it would, the electricity was used to create ice. And then during the day, instead of uh, running air conditioning, which would use electricity, then water would be sent through coils in the ice and the water would be sent to buildings to cool the buildings. And so this is effectively battery storage, even though there's no electricity involved here, uh, because it offsets electricity demand. And you know, batteries today are like 200 to $300 per kilowatt hour of storage. And this cost in 1998, it cost $38 a kilowatt hour. And so it's a cheap form of basically electricity offsetting storage. Uh, Thermal underground <laughs> energy storage. This is an example uh, in Okotoks, Canada, one hour south of Calgary. In 2004 and 2005, there were 52 homes that were built in a subdivision uh, on the roofs of the garages. Uh, the solar collectors on the top left were built. In, they have a glycol solution. And during the summer, when the days are long, that gly glycol solution absorbs solar heat. The solution is then piped to this building on the right where the heat is transferred to water. The water is then piped under this field that had been excavated and filled with rocks and, and pipes, and the field was then filled in. It's now a play field for the community. And the uh, rocks are heated up to, 80 degree, up to 80 degrees Celsius, and the heat is stored for up to six months uh, through to the winter time when the snow is on the ground, and then the whole system is run in reverse at that, well, during the whole period, but through the six month period, and provides 100% of the wintertime heating. And the heat, the storage, the heat storage for this is less than a dollar a kilowatt hour. In fact, it's less than 40, 40 cents a kilowatt hour compared, and I guess it's heat storage, not electric storage, but again, you compare it to 200 to $300 a kilowatt hour for battery storage. Anyway, so this is a form of district heating, which you're all aware, well aware of, and, but it's more long-term uh, district heating, so it's, it's seasonal heat storage. And you can do the same thing in underground water, caverns, and you know, other types of big storage materials. Uh, so th this is another type of thermal or type of storage. Well, Stanford, um, up till 2015, there was a big uh, the cogeneration plant, a gas cogeneration plant that provided 80% of the electricity and heat for the campus. Uh, that was bulldozed and replaced with these two boilers and a chiller, an elaborate piping system, uh, and the Boilers and chillers are powered by heat pumps, run on electricity, and the heat pumps take waste heat and for the heaters and waste cold for the, cool, for the chillers. So during the year, this is like the cold and heat demand during the year, the left is January, the right is December. So you can see during the bright blue and the bright, bright red are the heat and cold, cold and heat demand respectively. And you can see you have cold and heat demand simultaneously throughout the year. And then, but if you actually take you know, when you create cold, you have waste heat, and when you create heat, you have waste cold. And if you actually capture waste heat and cold and run them and use them to power the heat pumps to heat the boilers and the chillers, you can actually save a huge amount of energy. So this, combined with 60 megawatts of solar, eliminated the need for the gas plant. And then Stanford just committed a couple of weeks ago to go to 100% renewable by 2021, and so it actually bought 
uh, a new solar farm for another 70 megawatts, and that'll take it to 100% when it's finished in 2021. And so it'll be the first campus in the world to be 100% renewable electricity. And it's also committed to 100% uh, electrification of its transportation for all the university buildings and get to also go to zero greenhouse gas emissions. So it's, it's on the way, but Cal uh, I'll talk about the state itself is committed to go to 100% renewables as well, uh, which so everybody else has to do it inside of the state. So I just want to talk briefly about uh, individual homes. Um, so I'll just give an example. I built a home uh, that I moved into a year and a half ago, and I wanted to show you some of the things I did in this because there's no gas on the property and it's really energy efficient and I've had a year of data that I can show you. So, well, first of all, it was, the structure was a steel structure. So there's this company in Canada called Bone Structure and it had prefabricated recycled steel, about 80%. And so just basically the structure was unloaded in a truck and then it was put up like dominoes in the space of a few days. And so this was kind of what the structure looked like. Then you have to finish it off like a regular house. But, so that's part of it is the fact that there's no wood waste on the property when they're building the house. Uh, but it has, so everything's electric, so it has heat pumps, and this is called a ductless mini split, uh, air source heat pump, air heater and, water, and air conditioner. So there's indoor units and outdoor, in each zone of the house you have one of these indoor units, and then you have a couple outdoor units like that to exchange the heat with the outside. Um, so anyway, I'm not going to go into how the heat pump works, but it's basically just moving heat around and moving cold around instead of creating it or destroying it. So it uses one fourth the energy in this case as either electric resistance heater or gas heater. Same thing with the water heater. Um, there's a, a heat pump water he heater that's in the mechanical room. So it actually uh, extracts heat from the room itself to heat the water. And so that cools the room a couple degrees, uh, which is beneficial in the summer because then you can open the door and cool down <coughs> the rest of the house. Uh, but it again uses one fourth the energy as a traditional water heater. Uh, induction, electric induction cooktop stove, it, it's, it's about the same energy as a resistance stove or a gas stove in terms of raw energy and it costs about the same but uh, it boils water in half the time as gas and when you touch the stove it doesn't even feel hot because you're not actually producing heat on the stove, you're exciting molecules in the pots and pans and heating the pots directly. And then you only get heat on the stove by conduction down to the stove. And then there's solar on the roof and, and batteries in the garage. There's 13.6 kilowatts of solar. Uh, there are four Tesla wall mount batteries, but there are only two of them are active because my utility would only let me turn on two. And they, they have some silly rule that they made, they made up that only allowed two, but it turned out that's fine. Um, and then there are electric cars. And so I had two electric cars and then I have, my son also brings his electric car to charge every weekend. And so, there, so the data I'll show you are based on, on this. Um, so the first seven days of home use um, during, the su during the summer, the green is electricity uh, production by the PV. So you can see it's producing a lot of uh, extra solar. The light blue during the day is uh, home use of electricity, including battery charging. So the, ba the way this works is, the battery is discharged at night and then it charges in the morning as soon as home electricity demand is satisfied by the PV. The rest of the PV then goes to the battery and if there's excess after that, it goes back to the grid. And so down here at the bottom, if you can see it, you can see the cycling of the battery. It gets discharged every night and it charges every morning and then stays flat during the day when you have, still have solar. And then the PV gets drained at night. I'm sorry, the battery gets drained at night. So at night, you can see the blue, blue is battery use, dark blue at night. And so there's really no grid electricity except for when I'm charging the cars. So you can see the two big red spikes are car charging. And that's because the battery can't discharge fast enough and it doesn't have enough uh, capacity to actually fully discharge to supply for the, for the cars. But even during this week, um, I produced twice as much energy as I used. And so I sent back like half the energy that was produced from PV back to the grid. So during a full year, I generated 120% of all home and vehicle energy use, including for three cars. Uh, there was no electric bill, no natural gas bill or gasoline bill. Instead, because we now have the system of community choice aggregation utilities, that so there, my underlying utility is, is Pacific Gas and Electric and they, they control the transmission distribution grid but you can now opt out in California and many states for a community choice 
aggregation utility to take over the generation portion of your bill. So they will then offer you, you know, if I didn't have solar, they can offer you a 100% renewable energy option and they'll go purchase solar or wind to, or geothermal to do that. But in the case of when you do produce, they'll actually pay you at the time of use because we have a time of use system, tiered system, where at certain times of the day, electricity price is higher, like in, from 3 to 7 p.m., it's like 55 cents a kilowatt hour, whereas between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m., it's about 11 cents a kilowatt hour. So it's a five, factor of five difference, which is really good for demand response. But they'll actually, but the generation portion of that 55 cents a kilowatt hour is 28 cents a kilowatt hour. So the utility will pay me 28 cents a kilowatt hour when I generate electricity between 3 and 7 p.m., for example. So at the end of the year, with the excess electricity, they gave me a check for $520 or $528. So if I just look at these are numbers for think avoided cost, because I did not have to uh, have gas on the property, I avoided, a, in my case, $6,000, but it ranges from like three to $8,000 uh, just to hook up gas to the property. And that doesn't take any effort by the utility. They just take it and I ask them why, and they say, why do they charge this? And they say, well, everybody has to take a cut. So that's, but there's no actual reason. <laughs> and then, then by, gas pipes are like between one and seven thousand dollars in avoided costs. So in my case, maybe five thousand dollars. So it's you know up front you're saving like eleven thousand dollars, and then normal typical household, this is what they uh, spend uh, one to three thousand dollars per year in electricity, one to three thousand per year in natural gas, one to four thousand dollars for vehicle fuel. So you'd save four to fifteen thousand dollars up front, plus three to ten thousand dollars per year. Uh, if people did this. And there's, there are subsidies in the US and in California for the solar and the battery systems. But and so with the subsidies, the payback time is four to five years. And everything's warranted for 25 years. Uh, without the subsidies, there'd be payback time would be 10 years. So, uh, so, that's, so that's a little bit of about home. So now I just want to jump in to talk about uh, energy plans we've been developing for countries of the world. So we developed energy plans to go to 100% renewables <laughs> for 139 countries, and the, these are countries we had data for, and they represent more than 99% of all emissions. So if you aggregate over all countries, the end use power demand in 2012 was around 12.1 trillion watts. If you go to 2050, that rises to about 20.6 terawatts. And, but if you, uh, if you electrify everything and provide that electricity with clean renewable energy, Without using heat pumps, it goes down to about 11.8 terawatts, or at a 42% reduction. And with heat pumps, about down to 8.6 terawatts, or a 58% reduction. So how do you get such a big reduction of power demand just by electrifying everything? Well, 23 percentage points of that is because electricity is more efficient than combustion. Like your electric vehicle, 80 to 86% of the electricity goes into the car to move the car, whereas the rest is waste heat. For a gasoline or diesel car, it's on the order of 17 to 20% of energy, and the gasoline goes to move the car. The rest is waste heat. So just in, electric, in transportation, you reduce your power demand by a factor of four. But averaged over all energy sectors, the, the benefit is about 23%. And then 13% of all energy worldwide is used to mine, transport, and refine fossil fuels and uranium. And so we eliminate all that energy just by uh, going to wind and solar, where the wind comes right to the turbine, the solar comes right to the panel. Uh, if you converted all low temperature heating and all air conditioning and refrigeration to heat pumps, uh, you could reduce energy demand worldwide 16%. I mean, an individual heat pump will reduce demand by a factor of four on average, but averaged over all energy sectors, it's about 16%. And then we think we can get 7% end use energy efficiency improvements beyond business as usual. So we don't need to match 20.6 terawatts in 2050 if we do this, we actually need uh, to get down to 50 to 8.6. Now, these are, sorry um, uh, about this sloppy look here, but this is, <laughs> that's why you're using a PC, it's not all, it works on like this. Um, <laughs> so this is for Denmark, our 100% plan for Denmark, um, but this is without heat pumps actually, so this is in this, the, the, not the lowest case. But you know, our plan would be t about 26.5% onshore wind, 37% offshore wind, 4% residential rooftop PV, 2% uh, commercial government PV, and 29% solar PV power plants. Again, this is, this is all energy sectors, not just electricity. And this is just one option. I mean, there are many, several options. This was just one at the time that we did this. And then tiny amounts of tidal and about 1%, so wave. 
and you can see there's no, uh, zero of everything else. So that's, that's for Denmark, but uh, for the world, uh, when we look at all 139 countries, it's about 23.5% onshore wind, 14% offshore, 16% residential rooftop PV, 12% commercial government rooftop PV, 20% PV power plants, 10% CSP, less than 1% geothermal, 4% hydro, and less than 1% tidal wave. So it looks like we have wind, it would be about 1.7 million wind turbines. These are five megawatt wind turbines worldwide. Well, it sounds like a lot, but I'll show you how much land it takes up in a minute. Um, and then hydro, you can see there's no new hydro. These are the, on the right is the number of new devices we need. Uh, so anyway, the land area is required. Well, offshore wind doesn't require any new land or does tidal or wave. We're not adding any new hydro. Geothermal is pretty trivial in terms of what we're adding. So it's mostly utility PV and CSP and onshore wind. And the utility PV and CSP take up about 0.22% of land for footprint. And the wind takes up 0.9% land for spacing between the turbines that you can use for multiple purposes, including putting the solar on. And uh, so the total together is 1.14%. But again, most of that's space between wind turbines that has dual purpose. Well, you might ask, how much is that compared to the fossil fuel industry? So we did some calculations for the land areas required for fossil fuels in California and the US. So in the, in the US, there are 1.2 million active oil and gas wells, 2.6 million inactive <laughs> oil wells, 550,000 abandoned gas wells, 1,500 coal mines, 135 refineries, 1.6 million miles of pipeline, 161,000 miles of oil pipeline, 3,300 power plants, 115,000 gas stations, almost 400 storage facilities for gas. So they, they take up 1.3% of the U.S. land area, and it's 1.7% of California's land area. So, you know, it looks like our infrastructure for everything is going to take less area, at least for the U.S., uh, than this fossil fuel infrastructure. Well, the next question is, can you keep the grid stable with renewables? So we did storage. We uh, did grid stability analyses, seeing if we can match power demand with supply continuously for five years in each of 20 world regions encompassing the 139 countries. So these different scenari scenarios were with either, well, we had in one case, we did three scenarios, A, B, and C. In one case, with A, we did batteries, CSP storage, heat and cold storage, no heat pumps, no additional hydropower turbines, had hydropower storage, and we had hydrogen for transportation. And the cost of that overall was 10.6 cents per kilowatt hour for all energy. And we reduced energy demand 42.5%. So even if the cost is the same as fossil fuels in terms of per kilowatt hour, and we're, we're using 42% fewer kilowatt hours, so that's how much less cost there actually is to, the, to, to society. In case B was similar, except we added hydropower turbines, had no batteries. Case C, there were no hydropower, added hydropower turbines. We had batteries and we had heat pumps. And instead of storage, so no thermal energy storage at all, and so our, our power demand was down 58% in that case, and uh, the cost was about the same per kilowatt hour, but it's actually, the absolute cost is less because we have fewer kilowatt hours. But anyway, I just want to run through really quickly just some cases, some of the cases. We did it for five years, and this is uh, for one month in each case, just every hour, even though we actually did it every 30 seconds, uh, just shows for the US and Canada, which we combined together in this, matching the power energy supply with demand plus changes in storage plus losses and shedding, and we can match it pretty exactly every 30 seconds for five years. And then the same thing in Central America, uh, Cuba, uh, Haiti, Dominican Republic, Jamaica, uh, South America, New Zealand, Australia, Southeast Asia, Philippines, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, China, Mongolia, Hong Kong, North Korea, uh, Russia, Georgia, India, Nepal, and Sri Lanka, uh, Central Asia, Middle East, Europe, Iceland, and uh, Africa. So that's 139 countries. We're able to keep the grid stable. If we look at the, f at the electricity sector only today, and we march it forward to 2050, and, the, and bring it down to back to today's cost, the fossil fuel cost of energy would be about 9.8 cents a kilowatt hour plus 13 cents a kilowatt hour health costs, plus 16 cents climate costs, so it's 38 cents a kilowatt hour. In other words, the social cost, which is the health, climate, and energy cost, is about four times the direct energy cost. But 
in the wind water solar case just for the electricity sector marching forward it was about 9.7 so it's about the same as the direct cost of energy but again we're using 50 percent fewer kilowatt hours in all energy sectors was 10.6 cents a kilowatt hour so the social cost of the fossil fuel system is four times that of the wind water solar system per unit energy but the absolute social cost is eight times because we have twice as much energy use in the fossil fuel case. Okay, last part of this is just, well, what do people think about converting and what has been done so far? Uh, there's a public opinion survey uh, from last year with 26,000 people in 13 countries. And it says that 82% of the people want 100% renewable energy, which is a shock to me that that many people were interested in this. But only 66% of the people believed in that climate change was a global challenge. So it's really not very uh, concerned. It's disconcerting to see that not so many people are think that climate change is so important. But it, the good news is they don't have to believe in climate change to believe in the solutions to the problem. So, and the question is, why do they believe in renewable energy? Well, a lot of people think that renewables make countries more energy independent. And 73% say renewables boost economic growth. So there's energy security, there's economics, there's job creation. There's a lot of reasons to believe in renewable energy that have nothing to do with climate change, uh, even though I hopefully would think people th think that's an important issue. Uh, there was a similar poll uh, in the US in, among seven states that had a really similar conclusion. Nationwide, 64% of the people strongly supported the contention that the US should go to just entirely clean and renewable sources. Another 19% somewhat supported it. So that's 83% strongly or somewhat supported the contention to go to just clean and renewable energy. Uh, there actually have been bills uh, in, and resolutions proposed in Congress. Uh, there are five pending resolutions and bills, and now three of them actually can get voted on <laughs> because as of last week. Um, so there's a House Resolution 540 that calls for the U.S. to support a transition to 100% clean renewable energy. There's a Senate resolution for the same thing. There's a Senate bill to transition to 100% clean and renewable energy by 2050. And there are two House bills, 3314 and 3671, uh, to go to 100%, and actually one of them is by 2035 for both electricity and transportation. And in states, uh, there are several laws that have been implemented in Hawaii in 2015. They implemented a 100% electricity law by 2045. It would be just renewables. Uh, California has one by 2045, where 60% is uh, clean renewables by 2030, and the remaining 40% is either clean renewable, well, what they call uh, eligible renewables, which are mostly the ones I talked about, but they don't consider hydro as a re eligible renewable. So that's why they allow that though under the last 40%, it's either clean eligible renewables or large scale hydro or any other technology that, <coughs> that is yet to be invented that is zero carbon by 2045. So it's effectively a renewable, 100% clean renewable energy. Uh, then uh, Vermont has a 75% law. New York has a 50% law by 2030. And there are other proposals in other states that are still pending. Um, I'm happy to say that we did a study for California in 2014, and that was how to power California for all purposes. And this was the scientific basis for SB 100. Uh, we presented it to the governor's office in 2015, and that's right after that, they adopted a 50% standard for California. And uh, then sub this last uh, September, the governor signed SB 100, which was to bring California to 100% uh, renewables by 2045. Um, there are over 110 cities and counties across uh, the US that have committed to 100% renewables and a few in, in Canada as well. And there, well, there are also others around the world, so I'm not including all those in this list, this particular list. Uh, but yeah, there are lots of other cities and, and towns and counties that have committed to this. So it's really um, taken on this grassroots movement that a lot of nonprofits have been uh, pushing in all these uh, towns and cities. And there are over 154 international companies that have committed to 100%. Um, two, Apple and Google, claim to have already reached that. Uh, Google's trying to now match it hour by hour with their data centers, uh, even though because these commitments are all in the annual average as opposed to matching power demand with supply continuously. And then there are over 70 nonprofits uh, that have committed to this, and this is why all these uh, states and politicians, and there, are, and not only and and laws and commitments have been made. In fact, there are seven new governors in the United States <laughs> that have committed to either 100% or really large uh, percentages of renewable energy uh, coming up. And so just to summarize 
uh, I didn't talk about the job creation, but we did look at jobs and we found uh, worldwide about 24 million net long-term full-time jobs created over lost uh, for this transition. I mentioned it would require about a fifth of 1% of land for footprint for uh, mostly for solar and then 0.9% for spacing between wind turbines. And we'd avoid up to four to seven million air pollution deaths per year, slow then eventually reverse global warming. We think we can keep the grid stable throughout the world with 100% renewables. The cost per kilowatt hour is slightly less than that of fossils or similar, but the energy plus health plus climate cost is one fourth per kilowatt hour. And the absolute cost is about one eighth per kilowatt hour. And then transitioning to 100% in all sectors, we think it's, it's technically and economically possible. The main barriers are still social and political. Uh, the solution does require collective willpower, and, but immediate deployment uh, because yeah, time is running out, especially in, with regard to climate, but immediate air pollution health impacts. And if you're interested in slides, these slides, they're available at that link. And also our papers are available um, and there are infographic maps of all the country plans as well at the solutionsproject.org. So thank you very much.